All right, guys, so welcome back. Um, and let's just continue from where we left off before. So um, I'm right here in Kali Linux, and Kali Linux is just the, the behemoth of penetration testing tools that we have uh, at our disposable. So um, just to walk you through the lab, um, nothing very fancy. I've just got my Mac machine or MacBook Pro. And my MacBook Pro is hypervised with VMware Fusion. And I've got a couple of machines here. One was, you know, Windows Server 2012 that we used for a bit of testing. Uh, I've got my Linux box, my Kali Linux specifically, which I'll be using for our uh, penetration testing. And then I've got Windows 7 as a uh, quote unquote uh, victim machine that we're going to be getting access to. So Windows is predominantly used in a lot of production environments. Uh, and then all the networks that you test and hosts that you see are, are Windows 7 or Windows 10 now. Um, and I'm going to be using this guy as an example for us to sort of to see what we play with and all the stuff that we've got access to. All right, so I'm just going to make sure that I've got the recording enabled on the screen, which I'll do. Um, and you guys can see that fine. Cool. So let's continue. So the first step is what we want to do is create the payload. So um, in order for us to create the payload, we need to to make the payload and we need to reference a few things. So um, the first tool that we're going to use to do this is called MSF Venom. Now, there's probably a lot of tools out there that um, that you can use to create your payloads. Um, I'm not going to go through however many tools there are. I've, I've just liked MSF Venom when I'm creating this, and uh, it just works from what I want to do. So, um, MSF Venom is the uh, the built-in program that we're going to use within Linux. And if I just do a dash H, it basically says, "Hey." How do I just help me, MSF? And if I want to use you, show me how I can use you. And in just a moment, you're going to see and it says, hey, you know, in order to to use me, uh, here's how you can use me. It says do a dash P, dash L, you know, uh, format, encoder, and all that sort of, all these parameters that we can use um, to create the payload. So in this example, we're creating a Windows reverse shell that we're going to be uh, exploiting within Windows. So that's what we're going to create. So uh, I'll walk you through what I'm going to create. So MSF Venom, uh, the dash P just says it's a payload and that's right here. So the payload and the specify STD, STDIN to use custom payloads, blah, blah, blah. We don't need to worry about that. But in this case, it's just being, saying, hey, MSF, MSF Venom is the program that we're going to use. Dash TAC P just says, hey, now we want to reference this Venom reference to the payload and what is this payload that we're going to use it's a windows um, now there's probably so many uh, parameters inside in here um, this is the reverse shell that we're creating for this specific exploit if we're do if we're doing other uh, exploits and other compromises other exploits that we'll be creating this is just specific to the reverse tcp shell that we're getting remote access now to uh, the windows 7 box so this just says, hey, I need, it's a Windows box that we're, we're exploiting and we want to do a reverse session and we want to do a reverse TCP um, session back to us. Now we need to identify a couple of parameters inside this payload. One is the local host of the device that we're connecting to. Now in a real life situation, I'm very hopeless with uh, IP addresses and source IP addresses and what ports I'm assigning. So I'm always got notepads and documents up. Uh, in a lot of workshops, I usually ask for the audience and for you guys to remember uh, what IP address and what port I've used. But in this case, I can't do that. So I'm going to have to remember what protocols and ports I've used uh, for, in order for this attack to be successful. So as I said, that we're on the 192.168.1.136 uh, IP address. So that's my attack machine. Um, and cool, I don't need to know his host. So pretend now that we don't have access at all to this Windows 7 box, which we don't in the real world. Um, all I've got is my my internal IP address, in this case being the attacker machine at this range. So this is my private IP address. So going back to my payload, uh, I'm gonna say local host equals me, which was the 192 address. So 192.168.1.136.1.136.1.136.1.136.1.136.1.136.1.136.1.136.1.136.1.136.1.136.1.136.1.136.1.136.1.136.1.136.1.136.1.136.1.136.1.136.1.136.1.136.1.136.1.
So the port, remember before I was saying that the, the firewalls, will, or not the firewalls, the host specifically would generate their own source port and destination, well, their own source port of, of that device. So the reply traffic being initiated from my host going out through the internet, coming back, will get generated. So in this case, I want to pick a local port number for this device. It can be any possible number I want. So greater than 1023 and higher, right? So uh, let's just say in this example, my local port is going to be 3333. Um, this doesn't need to be specific for anything. I'm just creating a, a unique identifier to say, hey, this is my attacker machine. So to get to me, my local host needs the .136 with a local port of 333. That's my attacker machine. Um, a couple more things. We need to identify the format of this payload. The format's going to be an executable. That's what we're going to, not format, it's a format. Okay, uh, the format isn't executable, so it's saying it's going to be a payload, it's going to be executed when it's going to be run. And uh, now we are creating the actual name. So in this demo like scenario, I'm just going to give it a name called payload. Um, in other words, in other times, or another example is I might call it financial, you know, June 2016 financials or June 2019 financials. Um, and I just want to make it as realistic as possible, but in this case, it's just uh, I'm just demo casing this example to you guys, so I don't have to make it very neat and tidy. Um, so it basically just says, hey, I'm just going to create this format. It's going to be an executable, and the name of that file is going to be a payload.exe. And I just press enter there, and then that'll just take maybe a couple of seconds, and that should be done any time now. So just to backtrack, so MSF Venom is the, the tool that we're using. The TACP is invalid payload. Did I do a, whoops, so not reverse, reverse, it's interpreter. I was just reading and I'm going, what did I do wrong? So that should work now. Or it might be a slash windows. Uh, should be fine. There we go, cool. So the payload's now executed. So it says, hey, that payload has now been created. Uh, the module's been enabled. Um, the payload size, that's the, the size of the actual file. Uh, and that's the actual uh, final executable invite. So it's done. So if I just do an ls, so list the directory, anything with .exe, uh, you'll see now that there is my payload in my root file. So if I do a pwd, it says I'm in the root file of the current uh, word directory. So the, the present working directory is what pwd stands for. So I'm just asking Linux to say, hey, can you just show me where I am right now? And it's saying, hey, you are in root, which is the main main thing within Kali Linux, and there's my payload there that I've just created. So just to backtrack, so attack P, we are creating a payload, and this payload is specific for Windows. It's a meterpreter, so that just basically saying that uh, we're gonna create a reverse shell back to this host using TCP with our information just here. The format of this payload is an executable, and the payload name, well, the, the, the payload itself, which is a payload.exe, which is the name that we've created. That's step one. So step one was creating the payload, which we've, we've just done that now, and here it is. So we've got the payload. Number two is we need to now get this payload to the victim. So how do we do that? There's many, many ways. We can put on a USB. We can email it to them. Um, you know, we can put on a CD. We can send it through Facebook, through Messenger. We can just do anything we want. We create another fake website. Once they click that link, they'll download something. We can give them an attachment. There's so many ways that we can go ahead and do that. In this case, what we're going to do is, um, uh, I'm just trying to think on the fly and how I'm going to do this because uh, I just want to make it as realistic as possible. Uh, so, as I said, the step, now the second step is creating that web server. So I'm going to create a, a, an Apache web server. So he's going to connect to our web server and then he'll pull that down just like a normal download he would. Okay, so um, I'm just going to start Apache. Oops. 
and I've started. While I'm also here, I'm going to start um, MSF console. Um, MSF console, PostgreSQL. I don't know if you do that later. PostgreSQL is basically the database that talks to MSF console, which I'll talk about when I get to it. So it just means that I've just killed two birds with one stone in this example. So I don't have to worry about this now. Uh, we'll talk about it later. Um, so our web server has started. That's good. Um, what I need to do is I need to copy this payload that we've created. So this payload.exe, I need to create that payload.exe to the HTTP web server uh, front page. So when they go to the web server, they've got that payload there and they can download it. Um, so what I need to do right now is I need to move this file, uh, move payload.exe to, and we need to move it to the location of var, uh, what is it, dub, 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 uh, HTML, I believe. That should be the right thing. So if I go into var web HTML, and do a ls. So I've got a couple of files in here already. So there's my payload.exe. It looks like I was playing around with some other exes before, so I'm just going to remove them so I get confused. And if I do a quick ls again, so we've got our main payload that I've got here. So that's the one we've just created, and I've moved it to the main web address directory that um, we're going to have our as our Apache web server. That's where it lives. Um, so that's the location that we have to put it there too. All right, and the final step now is, um, so we've done step one, so we've created a payload, we've enabled our web server, so we've moved the file that we've created, which was the payload.exe, we've moved it to the, the proper web server location that now when the user goes and clicks it, they can, they can be able to download it. The next step now is we need to tie the payload to MSF console. So MSF console is the main Metasploit framework that we're gonna be using. Um, and basically what it is, is is like I was saying before, it's a framework that all these researchers come together and they just share information. Um, so it's all widely available to people like us and people that research. And, you know, there's two really cool ones that I really like using and Metasploit Framework is one of them and Empire is another one. Um, I'm not going to talk about Empire in this example. I'm just going to stick to Metasploit. Uh, if you guys want to Google Empire Framework, you can and understand how Empire is and how that works. It's very favoured in a lot of the red teaming engagements that uh, a lot of people that I work with, they love it. I, I enjoy it as well, but I just like the interpreter in this example that I'm going to be using. So, um, so let's get into it. So let's go into Metasploit or MSF Console. Um, let me go back to the main directory, uh, MSF Console. And we're going to find this up. So we started the PostgreSQL database before. So normally there's some issues with why it doesn't start. It needs a, a database to be assigned. Um, and now we're going to do that. So we've already assigned it. So we've started that service. And now we're starting the actual console. And this is what I really like with Metasploit Framework. It's got these little cool, um, you know, things. If I do a banner, it'll change, you know, and it just, you know, nice little fun things, you know, can see what they just go banner, banner, banner. I love sure. I love sure. Crash bunny, land turtle, boot, you know, and it's just, yeah, it's fun. <laughs> All right, cool. So let's get into this. So today it's saying, hey, I've got, you know, 17, 22 exploits. I've got 986 auxiliary modules, which is the reconnaissance side of things for scanning, uh, exploiting, you know, brute force and SSH and that sort of stuff. I've got 300 post exploitation modules, 507 payloads, encoders. And I'm not going to get into all these details, but as I was saying before, I think doing research in the last couple of weeks on um, Metasploit um, to give you fresh content. Uh, about maybe 10 years ago, guys, they probably had 50 to about 100,000 updates a month. Um, they've now almost four times that. Now they've got about 400,000 uploads, 400,000 sort of uh, research information every single month that research is sort of um you know feed metasploit so it's quite cool um so i'm going to quickly verify that the database that i've got is actually um connected and it is and that's, and that's a good step so if it wasn't connected it'll say not connected or uh, whatever and we have to connect the postgres database sql to that which now says cool i can use metasploit framework and then we'll say awesome now what do we do so the main thing that we want to do is we want to use the exploit that we've created. So I'm going to go, hey, I want to use the um, 
the payload that we've just created because now we're doing a payload like attack uh, and it's going to be a multi-handler which says hey i want to use this attack on multiple uh, avenues so use exploit multi-handler that's what it just says uh which we're going to enable that in just a second or not there we go multi-handler so you get the one wrong slash there and it, and it sort of gives you a bit of a, a, a heart attack in just a moment. So now we're inside, you see we've just changed the directory into the multi-handler directory. Uh, and now we're gonna say, cool, now that we've created our payload before, we wanna set this uh, module being the multi-handler, which is, hey, we're gonna use this exploit in multiple scenarios. Now we need to set the payload that we've created. Please set the payload that we initiated before, which was the Windows um, interpreter reverse TCP payload. What is going on tonight? Interpreter reverse TCP looks right. I'm just gonna get rid of the slash here. There we go, cool. So slashes, I've just washed my hands and I can't do a thing with them. So <laughs> you're seeing all the little errors that I'm getting. Um and that's good. I want you guys to see that. So um so now we're in that we're in that basically show net well not, not in the show yet but we're in the next sort of part of this which is we need to configure those parameters that we configured before which was the payload information um where we did the ip address the local port the local host so this information we need to now enable that within metasploit framework as well so that's all we're going to do right now now if i just do a quick um show options it's going to tell me Hey, in order for you to run this payload, you need to do a couple of things. You need to provide the local host from the payload that you've created, and you need to identify the local port. And that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna say, cool. So set local host. And our local host is 192.168.1.136. You're probably saying yes to use, but I I was just looking at that. Cool. So I'm gonna open that up. So one three six. So now we've set our local host. And then we have to set the local port that we've created as well, which was 333. <laughs> Terrible, I know. 333, cool. 333. Now, if those two parameters are wrong, um, it's not gonna work. So if this is 334 or 332, that's gonna be a mismatch and it's not gonna work. And sometimes a lot of the errors where things do not work um, is because there's obviously a, a, an issue or a a configuration issue. So now if I did a show, show option, it's saying, hey, show me what parameters I've configured, and it says you've configured these two uh, parameters in which it, what it is. So these two parameters is what it needs to operate. So for the reverse shield to be successful, we need to have a local host and a local port, which we do. So it's saying, hey, that's the address that you're gonna be listening on, and that's the local port that your device is, in this case, the attack machine will be listening on as well. And we're saying, awesome, we now want to run this exploit. So I'm going to do a dash H, which says, hey, help me. So if I want to do an exploit, what's the next step? So here it says, here are all the parameters that we can do. In this case, I'm going to do a tax, tax J and a tax Z, which is two things. I don't want it to interact with the session. So I want to interact with the session specifically. I don't want this pellet to do its own thing and start interacting. And I don't want it to run as a job. I want it to run as one time, execute, and that's it. As other parameters here, I'm not going to go into this because I'm going to be spending too much time already talking about the stuff. Um, we're going to not talk about that right now. Um, so let's go exploit dash j dash z. Um, so we're going to run, not be running it as a job, but we are going to be not either interacting with the session that we're going to compromise that host with. So it's saying, cool. Uh, I've started now listening on this specific details parameters. So I remember before I was talking about the five tuples. These are the first two tuples in my attacker machine. So I've got the IP address and the local port as well. So that's pretty much it. So on this end, we've now started to listen for those active connections coming into us. Let's now go over to the victim. Uh, and I'll make this screen a little bit bigger for you guys to see. Now, it's not going to be this easy, obviously, in the real world. Um, I'm just making it easy for you guys to sort of see uh, what actually happens once we got gained access to a device. So 
All right, cool. So hopefully you can see that. Um, I'm going to open up Windows Internet Explorer and I'm just going to browse to this IP address. So the 136 address. Um, that way we can just go, go ahead and download that payload. Now I'll show you something quite cool as well. Now I hope one, two, one, six, eight, one, two, one, two, six. Now I hope Windows Firewall's not on, which is going to prevent me from downloading this, but if it is, we'll disable it. So there's a payload that we've copied. So remember before we did the move um, slash dub, 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 var, so the var, dub, 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 HTML, this was us just to get, us, get that payload to the main site from for our Apache web server, and that's what we've done. And here's the actual payload now. So once the user has come to this host, this website, it's gone, hey, I've gone to this IP address, and now I'm going to download this payload. You know, we can rename that, we can change everything on it to be totally different things. I'm not going to do that now because it's going to take a long time for me to do that. And I just want to show you for, for simple sake how we can compromise something. So if I'm a user, I've just downloaded that, nothing's happened. I may download it again and just hit here and just run it and go, hey, it's not downloading, it's not doing its thing. IT, I'm downloading something, you know, uh, it's not running, it's not doing what I want it to do and God knows what we're actually doing. So you'll see on the other screen if this is working and hopefully Windows um, firewall is not on preventing that remote session to come back to us. Um, you'll see that it's creating all these shells back to us and it has. So this is what every researcher loves to see in the shell. So now we've got shell into this device. So anything that we can do from here, or as a user can do, we can also now do here over the internet. So we basically now compromise that host and saying, hey, session one has now been opened from this local machine from that remote host. And here's our timestamp. So it's now almost 11.22 uh, PM. Okay, and that's his local port. Well, that's his sort of remote port. Um, that's his IP address. And that's our information. And now we're going to say, cool, well, what can we do once we um, compromise this host? So the main thing that I want to do is I want to interact with the session. So um, if I do a session, it's going to say, hey, you've got this session that you can interact with. So as I was saying before, I want at least eight to nine. Nine is a good number of remote shells to a host. So I've only got one right now. And if that shuts off, I'm basically toast. I don't have another way back into this device. So uh, I want to create multiple ways of entry back into this host if you know he is who he says he is and, and things like that. So I don't want to recreate the wheel every time I go into a host. I want to have those sessions already there for me. So maybe the first three or four payloads get dropped or something may happen. I've got another four or three uh, that I've got existing foot holding to the network with. So now it's saying, hey, in order for you to interact with this session, you can interact with him via session ID one. Uh, this is the type of attack that you've got. So it's an interpreter Windows payload. That's the device information here. Uh, this is the connection information that we've got. So that's your information being the local device. And here's the remote device over here. So that's his information. That's what we can do. So that's what we're going to do now. So we're going to go into that session. Dash I says, hey, I want to interact with session one. And it's done. And it's saying, hey, starting interaction with session one. And it's given us the interpreter shell and all the amazing things that we can do now that we've compromised with this post. And oh my God, we can spend so long um, doing all this sort of stuff, but just, <laughs> I kind of know where to begin with this because there's so many things I want to show you, but um, you know, get user ID, we can get the username information, we can do uh, an app, show me the app table entry, you know, show me the routing information, um, you know, do a directory listing, show me where I am. So, you know, there's a password, I think I've sort of password or a download, hba.txt. So I'm doing some consulting work at a, at a thing there. Um, the one I want to look for is an actual password. I think I'm creating a password as a, password is the one. I think that's the one. Let me go into that directory. Cool. So <laughs> just as an example, um, what I what I'll talk about a little bit later as well is MACE. So the modified access um, uh, modified access entries in the network. So what the MACE values can do is each time we 
modify a document, it, it updates the MACE attribute. So anything that's been modified, accessed, um, last edited, it'll save that information here. So if I've gone into this, this text file and I've uploaded some information or I've made some changes, the date of this file will now change to the date of timestamp is now. So that's a bad thing because now as an attacker, if I've modified this file, it's left a footprint that's now been modified at, you know, 11.25 p.m. on Saturday, you know, the 13th of, of July. Uh, we can reset those attributes to whatever times we want. So with the MACE value, we can say, hey, uh, instead of displaying the time now, reset the MACE values to what the file may have been before we even edited it. So it'll go back to this specific date or a date not even here, we can do that maybe last year or the year before or whatever timestamp we want. So with a timestamp, with now that we've got shell access to this device, we can do what we know as time stomp, which basically just stomps this out, which is really cool. Uh, I'm not gonna do this now, but what I am gonna do is, I wanna see if I can actually go into this actual um, thing where I can show you some stuff. So I'm just gonna do a cat, which says, hey, I wanna see the contents of um, uh, home.txt and here you go so in here I've got looks like some bunch of passwords so PayPal so there's my email address password to PayPal Gmail logon uh, these aren't my actual password logon this is just an example that I created for you guys to see that even though there's a password.txt file you know all the passwords are in plain text so we can actually see them um, and that's there and the other cool stuff is we can actually edit it so I can go in the edit um, what's that file called? My recording machine just fell. So let me go back to there. All right, cool. So we can do an edit of that. What's that file called? .com.txt. So now that we're in the actual file, we can now go ahead and actually start editing it to what we want. So we can what can we do? Um, so do a tag file. That's the tree of home dot. There you go. So after I've edited that file, um, what I wanted to do specifically is I wanted to say, well, we can create another directory. We can go make directory. You have been owned. Oh, so I should just um cool. So we've created that directory now. So without the back without the brackets, it seems to have just created all the main sort of text that we've done. No one them. So we can now create these things and go inside there, create more files. Um, you know, make another directory. I have access to your computer. Ha ha ha. Okay. Yeah, I'll go back in there. And now, if I go back to the victim machine, we should be able to see. Is that password file? Mm -hmm. There you go. So it looks like it's also created those attributes. So timestamps of the time that I've created them, 
um, and it's got those files as well that we have. So the home file, and then we can go in there, we can edit things. And as you can see with here, the bad thing is that it's timestamped this. So now as an attacker, I want to timestamp it and, and erase that of, of me going in there editing that file or even having access to these files specifically. So I can go in there, I can get the information, edit it, change it, um, and do whatever I want. All right, so going back into Metropoda, um, other stuff that I can do, I can do dumping of hashing information of the database of local users. The cool one is the webcam. And that's what I want to showcase now because I was on a flight uh, a couple of years ago when I did this and I was working with a CTO of a company and, you know, we're flying down to Melbourne and we're on a plane and I did this thing to him and, you know, he sort of flipped because, you know, you see your, your face on your desktop uh, of this attack that I'm going to, this little thing that I'm going to do and it sort of freaks, it'll freak you out, you know, if this happens to you. Um, key scanning, key dumping, you know, if I do a key scan start, Oops, start. It's basically saying now, cool. The key stroking injection has started. So now as an as a user, if I'm over here and let's say I'm gonna to go to PayPal or any website, um, it's not gonna be re it's gonna be hashing or it's gonna be credential hashing, credential dumping my it's getting late, my brain sort of uh <laughs> it's starting not to work a little bit. Uh, PayPal.com. All right, so let's go to PayPal. And you'll see, even though the website is encrypted, um, you'll also notice that even though we've got key, the key injection uh, actually happening, uh, this is horrible. PayPal. Now, even though we're going to an encrypted website, you'll still see that the the keystrokes that we're actually capturing will also be in plain text as well. I've got any serious login. All right, so no matter what we're doing, let's pretend we're going to the mail. All right, and let's sign in. Now, I don't actually have an account with Yahoo, but let me just go next. Oh, okay, or oh, whatever, right? Now, if I go back here and I do a key scan dump, it's telling me, and as you can see, it's not very pretty, but you can still make out what they're actually doing. So we first went to paypal.com, then we went to google.com, and you can see the things that I'm pressing, whether it's enter keys or shift keys, the PayPal, then went to Yahoo, you know, and then there's the username that we've put in. So it's all in plain text. And once you start putting in credentials and usernames and passwords, you know, you're, you're basically sitting here, key, scan, key dumping everything that's happening. Uh, the mace attributes that we spoke about, so time stomping those attributes. Get system ID. So we can get, oh, I don't worry about that now. Okay. Um, so let's go over to this side of attack now that we can do the webcam side of things. So this is one of the attacks I was just mentioning before, um, doing these attacks. Um, so what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna do the webcam start. So I'm gonna stream the webcam. So from me now, the light on my machine has come up. Now there's ways to obfuscate the light from it actually coming up. You're not gonna be able to see my light because it's on my webcam. Um, but now it's saying that, hey, I'm streaming. So on the user side of things, unless it's paying attention to that green light, or, or we can obviously turn that off as well. Um, he's not gonna know that it's actually happening. So right now he's either working, you know, he's on PayPal, he's doing whatever, and the webcam is actually like it's streaming. So it's just verifying his screen. Um, I'm going to stop that. So I've got probably what I need for the next sort of attack. Um, okay. Control C that. Cool. So we've stopped that stream. 
Um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to send the session to the background. Now, this is what I mentioned before. Now, when you're working with multiple exploits within Metasploit Framework, it tends to get very clunky in the way that we can start interacting with these sessions. So using Armitage to do that, you've got this one console where you can interact with a thousand hosts and it's just very pretty and graphical in the way it works. I'm not going to do that in this demo because I'm not going to be exploiting a thousand hosts. But just for simplicity's sake, this is why it gets very clunky when using Meterpreter to do these types of attacks because now that I've got the exploit, I've got, I've got session one running, I might have three, four sessions, six sessions, 13, 14 sessions. It starts getting very hard to manage and understand where things are. Um, so now I've gone into the background of this session. So session one is still running. I still have got remote access to this host. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna search for a term called wallpaper. And once this comes up, uh, I wanna use that session. Um, so use post multi manage set wallpaper. So now we're in this session, and once I do an option, it's going to say, Hey, I need these two parameters in order for you to use this exploit. So say, Cool, I need to set the session. So, what session are we going to use? Um, so, in this case, we've got session one, which is the, the session that we have. So session one. So it says, hey, session one has been enabled. Uh, and we also need to set one other parameter is the wallpaper file. So I believe that uh, that file has been saved on our root, on the main folder, uh, root directory. So I'm gonna go into root. I'm not gonna tab that, that's fine. Um, desktop. Uh, this is where it gets really, um, going back into this thing. So that's the file that I want, which is the JPEG. If I go back up, I just want to search for the one, this one, SCD. So let's just use those two, that's fine. So let me go back into my session. It's cool, now I want to set the root and see what I mean by it gets very clunky. I can't use multiple windows within that because if I do, it's going to lose that session. So uh, I'm going to have to go back and get that ID number. Or can I do this? Oh, cool. So I can. All right. So um, so set root desktop, and what I want is let's get this. Up. And that's been set. So now I want to do an option. Options. So both of those parameters have been set. We've set the session of one. We've set the wallpaper file as well. And what I want you to pay attention to is the background of this wallpaper. And what you're gonna see in just a second when I run it, oh no. <laughs> that's not good. Um, oh, that's why we didn't set the wallpaper. Uh, let's set wallpaper file. <laughs> Root. There we go. Desktop. The night time really affected me. <laughs> Set root desktop. Set root. Let's just go UI. Right. There we go. 
and there you go. <laughs> so imagine if you are actually flying, you know, in the airplane and you're actually seeing this, uh, you'll actually sort of, um, you know, have a bit of a heart attack happening. So, you know, one of those attacks was me doing that to him and he's just sort of flipping out going, you know, what the hell are you doing? You're crazy. Um, you know, swear word up to swear word. <laughs> so now that we've got access to that device, you know, there's just endless things that we can do. You saw what we can do with the mace attributes. We can edit timestamps, timestamping, um, you know, webcam stuff. Uh, you know, look at that. Let me go back to two sessions. Cool. And then there's multiple, multiple, multiple things that we can start doing. So that's just a little demo of some stuff that we can do. Um, there's more things, there's processes that we can kill, we can view processes. Like I was doing some stuff with some red teaming and we had access to a device on the other end. And each time the user, each time the blue team tried to launch Wireshark, we'd see it in the process. So we kept killing it. So it'll keep loading, kill, load, kill, load, kill, load, kill. And, you know, and then they opened up the command line and he's like, um, they're going to the command line because I knew they were doing an attack. So he goes, you know, hey, Andrew, you stink. <laughs> Go away. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, thanks, man. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, once we start having those things, like there's just multiple things that we can start doing. You know, we can do, um, we can migrate to other services that are running. Um, there's just endless stuff clearing the event logs, executing other apps, executing programs, executing, you know, sessions, just doing whatever the hell we want. And, and it just gets interesting. We can start rerouting stuff. We can change the IP address information. Next day, we can start playing with the ports. It just, it's endless fun right now. We can upload, download files. We can modify files. We can remove files. We can do shadow locks. So I was talking about shadow before, which means now that they're on the command line, if they go to the command line and do an IP config, they won't even be able to. They won't even able be able to actually do those commands. So we can lock the, We can lock down exactly what they can type, what they can't type. We can start doing other awesome stuff now. You know, you know, get working directory so it tells us where we are. So we're in this folder. You know, it's just endless, endless possibilities right now. So uh, I know this was a little bit long, and we sort of covered a little bit of details. And I hope you've understood some cool things now with remote access and things that we can do and exploit with. Uh, I hope it's been a bit fun on your end. Uh, it's definitely fun on my end talking about this and showcasing this with you guys. Um, if there's been any questions around this sort of stuff, uh, anything that you want to know more about, you know, just reach out to me and let me know. All right, guys. Uh, I think that's it for tonight. I'll finish up some of the recordings and I'll make the rest available to you over the next. Uh, day or two and then you have the full recordings available. Uh, I hope you had fun and I'll speak to you guys very soon.